as has been said, I have, um, I personally think, a very interesting job. I go out and visit professors and talk to them about what they do in teaching, about the challenges that they face, and um, I try to develop um, sort of strategies with them on how to overcome those and how to make the students successful, basically make them able to stand on the top of, of the top of the shoulders of the people that went before them. So um, it's really exciting. I get to talk to people from a lot of different fields and I really, really enjoy it a lot. By the way, if that sounds interesting to you, we're looking for a couple of people with an engineering degree and a fascination for education, so um, please feel free to approach me. That sounds interesting for you. Um, so, okay, the first thing I want to uh, sort of show you is this number. And I will get to, back to this at the end of the talk. It's 1.513 seconds, and I think it's really a very, very fascinating um, example of what students can achieve when they're being motivated correctly and when they band together to try to achieve something great. So um, I'm really, really happy for the talk that Jose Carlos gave before me, so I can basically skip over a lot of things. I'm also happy I edit, oh, it's coming up here. Um, I'm also happy I edit the dots, so you can see that the list is not complete. More stuff is basically coming um, for engineers. Things are evolving, and there are a lot more skills that engineers are actually supposed to have in the future. But that is not only true for engineers, Okay, that's not only true for engineers. There are, other, um, there are other fields. Actually, most of the fields are evolving and skills are being needed. So this is a, um, this is a quote from the president of the National um, University of Singapore. And he said that computational thinking and programming is something that is not only valuable for the people that traditionally learned it, but basically for everybody. Um, so it's basically a common language that's, say, common engineering language that everybody should speak. So um, this is really something that I um, encounter a lot when I talk to professors, is that they need their students to have basic skills, um, basic skills um, in programming, in computational thinking, and professors are not, always, um, are not always prepared or don't always have the time to actually prepare each individual student with different backgrounds for this. So there we go. Um, so really something that comes up a lot is the need for some kind of training that the professors can send their students to that give them baseline skills. The baseline skills that <laughs> I will just, I'll just continue talking and maybe, maybe you can see it. OK, so the baseline skills that the students need to actually successfully participate in the class and to um, take in the message that the class is actually focusing on. So it's important that the professors have the time to focus on the teaching of the things that is sort of the, the, the content of their class and not teaching skills or tools that may actually be um, just sort of needed in the class to succeed. So we talk a lot about online training. And um, just as a side note, as far as today, there's no artificial intelligence involved. Um, unless you do the deep learning or machine learning training. So uh, it's still safe. OK, um, something that I encounter a lot with my, my professors when I talk to them is that they say, OK, if we're being honest, my students, they learn something for a test, but really learning and grasping the whole subject, that only happens if they repeat it and have to apply it in certain contexts. So um, if we look at a typical engineering degree program, and this is um, electrical engineering, but you can basically exchange this for uh, any other engineering degree, then it looks something like this. And um, when you now think about where mathematics is introduced, okay, where mathematics is introduced, um, I, will just, I will just keep going exactly, then you see that mathematics is constantly introduced in several subjects throughout the degree program. But what's more is that you will also find that mathematics is being applied in a lot of the classes. And you've seen all this before. Um, 
but in many, in many, um, in many situations that I see, this learning curve that is being generated by this is not being generated for computational thinking. So if you go back and think about computational thinking and where that has sort of been introduced, where programming plays a role in a degree program, then with all the degree programs I encounter, because I talk to professors and educators, mostly in Germany and Switzerland, but also in other countries, then what oftentimes is a scheme is that you find programming in the first year, and then it sort of calms down. The programming language is not really used. Then in the second or third year, maybe there's a class that does some kind of programming, maybe the numerical methods. And then in the last year, when you talk to students, they will tell you, yes, I have this diploma thesis, master thesis, this project, and I need to use a programming language. Um, or the educators tell me, I ask students to do, this, to do this task, but they come back to me and say, I know I learned this, I know I learned the use of a programming language to solve my problems, but I really have to start over. So um, in a lot of cases, um, this is a problem, and what oftentimes is a solution to this forgetting curve, to really, to this sort of um, decreasing, decreasing skill problem that you have when skills are not being reused, is to implement, implement computational thinking throughout the degree program. And this is, um, this you've heard this before, and this is not rocket science, so that you can ramp up the skills to the end of the program where they can actually um, implement their design projects and then go out into the industry, uh, um, into research project at university, and really um, succeed there. So um, what are different, different methods of actually implementing um, computational thinking into different, um, into different classes. And uh, one option is to actually come up with um, sort of integrated storytelling with, um, with um, interactive documents that allow you to both give the student a background story, give more information on a topic, and also create a space for computation and for experimentation for the student so they can um, come up with a um, come up with a narrative, with a story that sort of appeals to them and also helps them grasp the problem and um, really, really um, sort of drill deep into it. Something else that I often encounter is that professors tell me, I would like to do more practical programming, but where do I start? Where, how do I do this? How do I start? Because it's a lot of work. But there are a lot of resources out there that you can find where um, very much in depth to your situation, your class, your, your situation that you're in, your students, you can find materials that you can get from other people. You can actually share and exchange them. It's part of my work to um, suggest things that can be shared, to work with other educators, to bring people together. And what I really, really enjoy is bringing people together um, across boundaries of countries. Um, the other day I talked to a professor who told me she wanted to do something in software-defined radio and I happened to have a very good colleague in Italy um, who's A, interested in the subject and B, has been working with several professors on a topic like that and it's part of my job to connect these people and it's really a lot of fun. So um, despite the curriculum or next to the curriculum uh, that's actually available, there are also hundreds of books, thousands of books actually available on education, and that's also a good resource if you can pinpoint the right one and um, help people find this book to help them teach. Now, the next step is, okay, you're doing some kind of computation in your class, you're asking your students to do something, you give them some homework, but then all this homework comes back. So you need to find a way to actually give feedback. Yes, you need a way to give feedback. And um, there are automatic systems in place that help you give your students individual tasks online that they can read and work into at the, in their own time, solve the problem with code, program something, send in the solution, and they get immediate feedback. How are you doing? What maybe is wrong? 
and um, they can immediately go back and change things. Um, we've actually had a couple of tests that indicate that students love it very much and that it's actually very good interaction. Um, it helps them keep focused. And then when they come back into class, because you've seen the results, you've seen the overall class performing, you know this is a subject that I've got, got to go back to. This is an aspect I've got to explain. This question went well, so I'm not going to go back there. And you really, really can do a lot of um, sort of data-driven decision making in your teaching. So that's really, um, it's really great. So it saves you a lot of time, especially when you have big classes. Um, the university where I come from, mechanical engineering, they have 1,100 students in year one. Um, if you would get back homework from all of them, it would certainly be um, a crazy amount of work to just correct code. So um, if, you're, if you want to scale in your teaching, if it's more than a couple of students, then a system like that can actually help you a lot. So um, a couple of other things, um, and we've heard it before. There was a, um, um, there was a report uh, also last month, actually, uh, from MIT and it called for work-based learning and societally relevant projects for students and those not, ju not just bolt-on activities. So it's not that just something that you put into one class or the other at the end of the term, but should be interdisciplinary connected with all the other teaching. And it's actually relevant. The topic is relevant to the students. So. Um, there are a lot of topics out there that might be interesting to the students to do. I mean, from logistics problems that actually um, concern them in everyday life. If you try to order something online, um, solving problems that um, concern your mobility and the environmental protection in the future, or um, just servicing humans. Um, because we have an aging society, it's really, really interesting to design robots that help help humans do their individual tasks. This is, by the way, Justin. Um, his task is to grasp things, but very, very carefully, because a robot can easily crush anything. So he learns to grasp things nimbly, but carefully. And that's really an interesting task to do. So these projects might, might be a bit big. You might not be designing a Justin just yet. But um, there are a lot of products out there that help you um, sort of bring in project-based learning and really, really interesting project. One of them is actually coming out. Um, it's the Arduino kit. It's a um, combination of an Arduino and software to um, help you build several projects that are really, really exciting and interesting, well-documented, and it's going to be out soon. And I personally am looking forward to get my version on my desk because I really, really love playing with those things. Um, there's a lot of other hardware that you can use in your projects, and it's really, um, it's really a wide scope of things, and depending on your special situation, a special piece of hardware is actually what you're gonna need. Um, not every piece of hardware is applicable for every situation or every professor, and I oftentimes have conversations with professors about, is this the right piece of hardware? Just because somebody else is using it and it's interesting, it might not be the right piece of hardware for you in your project or what you want to try to do. So um, there's a lot of different pieces of hardware out there, as I said, and you can do a lot of things with hardware. You can stream um, with hardware, you can send commands, you can get back data, and you can sort of actively involve hardware that way, or you can generate code and actually work with embedded systems. Um, so that's also a very, very interesting aspect. And in a lot of classes, it actually makes sense to think about integration of low-cost hardware. So a lot of these you've heard about. Um, these are all things that you could use in teaching that could make up for an interesting class and that can really, really give the students um, the feeling that they're, they're doing something hands-on. Um, it's kind of a bit like Hello World, where um, these days, you're not putting in some code and it says hello world on the screen. You're actually doing hello world with hardware. You're, you're interacting with your environment, either measuring something or actively working with it. And that's really something that makes students love their class. The next thing you can do is actually integrate a system that you create in a class 
into the internet and um, stream, some, stream some data, um, get started with your IoT project. Um, you can send up data to the internet, get data back, share data with students. So if you're doing an experiment, try thinking about the next time just using a streaming platform to share data with your students to make it more interactive. Instead of just giving them a file, you can ask them to download stuff from the internet where data is being generated in real time. So there are a lot of things you can do. You can visualize data and really sort of get the students um, to interact with the data that's being generated from your, uh, or from your um, experimental setup. So um, I would like to show you an example of a university where they do a lot of these things and um, where they're really trying to put the student at the center. They're trying to um, teach with a project focus in mind. It's a short video. I hope it's going to run and I hope the sound's going to work. Um, if not, I'm not going to dub this one. Robotics Association Embry Riddle is a student organization that competes in uh, all six of the AUVSI RoboNation robotics competitions. I actually decided to come to Embry-Riddle because of the robotics lab. Touring the Robotics Association facility and then just seeing all the different projects, they were really into showing off the lab and showing off the projects and really engaging me. Here at Embry-Riddle, we really emphasize hands-on experiential learning. That starts in the classroom and also in our extracurricular activities. Instead of just sitting in classes and learning about theory, the students get a chance to actually go out and apply that theory. And so we think giving students that exposure to, to that kind of hands-on engineering is preparing them more effectively for work in the industry. You're also learning a lot of soft skills, so teamwork and communication. You're always going to work in a team no matter what. Project management, time management, design cycle, software, systems integration, and systems engineering skills. And it allows them to go into an interview and go into a job and actually immediately begin to help out their team. Just having an engineering degree puts you in a field with many other applicants for positions. There has to be something that really distinguishes you from the rest of the, those applicants. Being part of these competitions does that. I'm a big fan of both MATLAB and Simulink. I think they help us focus on the actual problems and not on the coding part as much. Having the campus-wide access to the MATLAB licenses was a massive benefit for the students. Before, you had to come in to school, you had to be on campus to use the tool set, and it wasn't always productive, especially the things that we're doing. We take robots out in the field, and we need to have access to the tools somewhere away from campus. So it's really a unique opportunity they have to come up with an idea, actually put it into practice, go out, test it, and prove it against the best in the world. So it's a few one of the few times they'll ever get to do that, and that's that experience is what I want them to leave with. Okay, there's something I still owe you, and that's talking about the number. So here it is again. 1.513 seconds. And what I usually do is I ask people what's the fastest electrical car? The fastest accelerating electrical car. And what's the usual answer? What do you think? Tesla, Tesla. exactly. That's the answer that always comes. 1.9 seconds. It's slow. So um, <laughs> the winners in this contest are actually from Switzerland, DTH Zurich. They participate in the Formula Student. And um, I've had the pleasure of being at the Formula Student event, in Germany at least, several times in these past years. And it's always really exciting for seeing 3,000 students working on more than 100 racing cars, um, building this stuff and just sort of breathing the spirit. And um, this is the video. Um, I didn't start it automatically because it's really quick. So I um, hope it starts now. <laughs> That's the whole thing. That's all it took to make an official world record and a lot of hard work from a student team. OK. Um, with that, I would like to close. I would be really happy if in the remaining time um, you show up at our booth. We've been talking to a lot of people. It has been great. Um, my colleague Alex asked me to point out that there are a few t-shirts left, which he put over there next to the water. And I ask all of you 
to check if there's one left. And if you want one, just grab one on the way out later on. But first, you have to um, uh, you have to wait a bit. And there's another presentation coming up. So um, thank you very much for your um, time and your attention. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.